But that's not the first. subject of our first author. That's right. All right, I'm going to give you introductory honors on this one. We are honored to have David O. Stewart, a friend of mine for a, a lot of years, a reformed lawyer who is now a <laughs> uh, historian and author. How many books do you have out now? Ten. Ten books on everything from George Washington to, you know, it's, you, you, no, you didn't do George Washington? I did. Oh, okay. I thought oh, so. I thought, yeah. okay. So, and now. He did kind of give you a no head shake. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was. Uh, and now uh, in the spring, is it out yet or is it about to come out? No, it just came out in April. Okay. The Burning Land, which is, we'll give you a chance to, to plug it in, in a little bit. But you also did an article in the not American Spectator, American Heritage. Correct. That deals with uh, Civil War PTSD. And f first of all, it, this is a big Civil War area, era, area. And um, so tell us a little bit about how that happened and, and what you found out. Because PTSD is kind of a modern term. T completely. It, it comes from the Vietnam era, of course. Um, I was writing this book, uh, The Burning Land, about uh, uh, an ancestor um, and a story that came down through the family. And, of course, the family story turned out not to be all that true. Um, and he survives the war uh, and then has to deal with what his the rest of his life is going to be like. And he's changed. And, you know, f for millennia, people have known that Men come back from war, and a lot of them are different. Uh, it's just such a searing experience. And that was true in the Civil War, and I, I wanted to try to capture that without making him a, a cripple in some way from the experience. And uh, I started looking into it, and it, it turned out to be a really interesting uh, bit of uh, study that's been going on just the last 20 years or so, uh, trying to figure out what was going on with the Civil War soldiers, uh, with the veterans when they came home, uh, and, you know, turned up some really surprising things. Such as? Well, I mean, the most obvious to me was uh, this great Confederate general, uh, James Longstreet, uh, who was Lee's right-hand guy after Jackson dies, um, and was in dozens of battles. You know, he was a hardened uh, warrior. He, he had been... He'd seen acres of corpses. He was a tough guy. Uh, he got shot at the Battle of Wilderness. And afterwards, um, it, he got shot badly. It went through his throat, and it was he had to be helped off the field. It took him five months to recuperate. And when he got, you know, was off recuperating, um, he would cry uncontrollably. And he would say, I don't know what it is about getting shot that makes a man a baby. And I was just struck by how that's a crystallization of the PTSD experience that we see now, which is you lose some control over your emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's unsettling, particularly to men who have been taught to be tough and to control their emotions. And they feel shame that they can't do it. And I think that's sort of part of the double whammy of PTSD, which is... Um, you hate what you're doing. You hate what you've become, and that, that's just hard to pull out of. And, and there are people who have terrible trouble with it. So, you know, this is happening 170 years ago. So, and, and to a, a guy who, you know, war was his life. So it must have happened other places. And I, you know, was scratching around. and It's hard to figure out, but scholars have been looking into this, and they find a lot of evidence that, you know, it – they didn't have the word PTSD. They had sure. weird words for it from our perspective. Like shell-shocked and thousand-yard stare. Shell-shock is uh, in thousand-yard. Shell-shock is World War One. Thousand-yard stare is World War Two. Um, er, everybody's coming up with their new vocabulary. It, in Civil War, they called it, uh, one group called it nostalgia, which sounds sort of gauzy and friendly to us, but to them it meant depression, really profound sadness um they had something they, they noticed uh, one doctor noticed that there were guys who had these fits where their heart rate would just go through the roof and uh he called it soldier's heart or irritable heart it, today we would call it a panic attack i mean these were guys going through terrible trouble but we didn't have they didn't have the language to describe it in a way they were describing symptoms 
they didn't understand the cause directly. You know, when they saw a guy who was having trouble in battle, the doctor said he was a coward. He was a malingerer. And, uh, you know, he was pretty much dismissed. And there were a lot of people who suffered from that who, who never recovered after the war. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it became uh, something that families had to cope with. It was not understood the way we understand it. And an interesting thing is we don't treat it, our therapies, our way of treating it, aren't a whole lot better than they were in the 1860s. I imagine post-traumatic stress is probably as old as the first person who was ever put in a stressful situation that survived thousands and thousands of years ago. Yeah, I think it's fair. If you look at, you know, uh, the Iliad by Homer or Gil the Epic of Gilgamesh, which goes back even farther, there's accounts of soldiers who get off balance from the experience of combat. That experience, that terror of facing death, of having to kill, um, it can change you. And uh, it does change some people. And uh, it, it's something we need to understand better just to help people, but also, you know, maybe we ought to be thinking about this also when we look at war. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're thinking about a war, we're not just going to lose these people on the battlefield. We may lose them afterwards. Also, I think <clears throat> there has to be some element of the inescapability of the danger. When yes. what, in, in your article in American Heritage, you say that the the survivability rate or the death rate was one in four. Yeah, it, it was terrible. And some of that was disease, but a lot of it was just slaughter. So when 25% of your, your coworkers, your, your other, your friend, your comrades in arms are, are dying, that would be, uh, that'd be very disturbing. Yeah, it, it's terrifying. And that's what changes. There, this wonderful novelist, Carl Marlantes, who wrote a book called Matterhorn about his, based on his Vietnam experiences, had a piece recently where he talked about how on his first patrol, he went out and was in the jungle and realized he heard a sound and he didn't know what it was and he couldn't figure out what to do. And then he had that moment where he thought, I should be dead. If that was an enemy, I'd be dead. And he said his mind changed at that moment and he spent 60 years trying to change it back. So that sort of terror, it, 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 you know, we're, we're animals too, and mm -hmm. we react to it. So contemporaneously, what was done with these folks who had, obviously they can't stay on the battlefield. Uh, they tried to get, jolly them up enough so they could get back to the battlefield. The first step was, of course, shaming. Um, and sometimes it worked. Uh, many of them would, would end up deserting, and there were punishments for that if they were caught. Uh, and some of them committed suicide. Uh, it, it, there, there's few good answers if you've got a bad case. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a spectrum. You know, there are folks who have some symptoms, and but they can cope pretty much. Um, but there are folks who have acute symptoms. Uh, a bunch of them ended up in asylums for the rest of their lives, not diagnosed with any particular war-related injury, but people knew they just were crazy. So how do you do this research if, if the language did not exist contemporaneously? I mean, they're not saying PTSD. Not, so how to do your research, how, what rabbit hole did you go into? Uh, it's very tough, and the people who are doing it, I, I was, you know, riding on other people's coattails mostly, but they have to go through the original medical records, and as I said, the doctors weren't very good at saying this guy's had a terrible combat experience. That's why he's acting so weirdly. They would say, you know, he's he's a bad guy. He's a weak. He's a weakling, and you know, he's you know, you can't trust him. And people would have to interpret that. And what the scholars do is they they go through the medical records, and they were better for the Union Army than for the Confederate Army. Just the record keeping was better. And they then try to figure out how did they end up. 
you know, if they were a suicide, well, that's sort of a red flag. If they ended up in an asylum, that's a red flag. A bunch of them ended up uh, so restless. That's a, one of the symptoms is a restlessness. When they went home, they couldn't live with their families anymore. They just were so off balance. Um, they took to the road. We had new railroads for the first time in our history, and they rode the rails. It, it, it was our first generation of hobos, um, which is a, I always associated it with the Great Depression in the 1930s, but it actually began with Civil War vets. Um, and a lot of them moved out west. I mean, <laughs> a bunch of the bad men of the west who get notorious reputations, well, there are guys who had a lot of trouble coming out of the Civil War and, you know, were, were violent because of it. Was was it similar after the Revolution? Were the, were the Colonial War veterans in you know, the same bed? The, the medical records are less and less uh, the farther you go back. You know, and there, you know, there was a, there were a few doctors then, um, but they're not keeping track of that sort of thing. So you you can't document it the same way. I mean, I have to say, I, I come to this not with an experience in combat, but having read so much about it, seems to me every conflict, there are people are going to have this reaction, and we've always had it. And it, it's not unique to our culture. It's not unique to Vietnam or to Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, it's the experience of, you know, Im imminent jeopardy. Does it matter that the Civil War was unique in the sense that it was Americans killing Americans? I, I imagine that was a layer. I imagine if you have family on the other side, your emotions are roiled up even higher. But I haven't seen a study that talked about that, um, so I, I can't say. Mr. Harvey. So I would have to say another layer of that would be the intimacy of the fighting that occurred during the Civil War versus uh, today maybe where you're looking at a, a monitor and you're launching a, a missile from a drone. That's a question. It, do you, is there a difference with that? Because it, it seems that there might be. I, I think there is. I think – they have documented that the, the drone pilots uh, wear out. The, Very high rate of PTSD among dr drone pilots. Yeah. So they know what they're doing. They watch what they're doing. You know, one of the amazing things that this research led me to was it can be difficult to get soldiers to kill. You know, we think of that's what they're supposed to do. But when a soldier faces that situation, there is a lot of training, religious training, ethical training in our lives, just our culture, that you don't kill. And, you know, there's this wonderful study of World War II. They tried, the Army wanted to figure out how many bullets it took to kill an enemy. And it was 45,000 bullets had to be shot in order to kill someone on the other side. Because they would shoot over their head or hey, shoot the a ground. Lot, a lot of people just shooting to scare the other guy, you know, get them to go away. That's fine. Um, a lot of people get rattled and they, they don't aim very well. And there's other people who just don't want to kill. And, you know, there's a wonderful book by a guy named Dave Grossman called On Killing. And he talks about training soldiers to learn how to kill. And a big breakthrough was when they, in target ranges, they started using human cutouts instead of just the bullseye because you had to get used to aiming for some you know a human figure's body um that takes training i mean on tv it looks like a piece of cake everybody you know everybody can shoot everybody and they never miss but in the real world it's harder than you think I don't know if you all saw in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, there was an article about a Russian soldier who surrendered to a drone. <laughs> I, Did you I, see that? I saw the film. This, this no, guy, uh, it was a Russian soldier. All of his comrades were dead. And he was in a trench. And the, the Ukrainians were sending drones and dropping grenades. And, and they were hunting him. They were hunting him. They were getting him. So he actually surrendered to, to the drone, You know, made this kind of praying motion, and then... The drone pilot got permission from his superiors to drop a note written in Russian that says, follow the drone and you'll be safe. So you had this guy running across no man's land and the Russians now are firing artillery at him to kill him because he's running away. So in the Russian army, you're not allowed to run away. So it's really dramatic footage. It gives me a chill just, just talking about it. So did you write a book recently? 
Well, be, before we <laughs> before we move to that, I just, I just wanted to say the suicide rate among veterans in this country is as high as 22 per day in America, and that's just something to keep in mind as we talk about PTSD and sometimes what are very, very delayed reactions to combat stress. It, it's a very painful statistic. So. Terribly, yeah. Go but ahead, that was such a good question, of course. <laughs> There is my book, The Burning Land, which talks about, uh, it follows a Civil War soldier um, from Maine through some of the terrible battles of the war and then to his, you know, trying to return to normal life afterwards. And how, so, well, I can't ask if he makes it, I guess that gives it away. But so the research that you did for, the, the book, does that go beyond what was uh, the, the PTSD, or was there a lot sure. of... Sure. Um, it, it was inspired by an ancestor, so I know his medical records. Um, he was really terribly wounded after... He was just a private. He was a regular guy, and he ended up as a uh, lieutenant. He, he made it through the ranks. Um, he's hideously wounded uh, and takes a long time to recover. And, uh, you know, my... I got into the story because my mother told me she wore a ring that had been taken off his finger on a Civil War battlefield as he lay dead. Well, he didn't die there. So we figured out a few things. Um, and his unit, he was in the 20th Maine Infantry, was a very effective unit um, that sometimes there's probably five or six Regiments were given credit for winning Gettysburg for the Union Army, and that's one of them on Little Round Top. They had a very pivotal uh, uh, battle. So I had to research all of that and also, of course, just what the world was like. Um, it's important to put them in the place. If you're going to write historical fiction, you need to understand what their life was like uh, and you know, get that right. And one of the interesting things to me was uh, he's from a town in Maine where they built ships. He was a carpenter building, helping to build ships. And that town, uh, unlike a lot of New England, was not pro-Lincoln, was not pro-abolition. They built ships mostly for southern cotton merchants, and they thought it was a bad idea to kill their customers. So they didn't want to go to war. And then he goes off to war, and that's a terribly stressful thing when the people at home don't support your relative who is off fighting a war. So, again, that's another one of the conflicts that was built into the situation. It, it, was there any lessons that you learned from your research on this book that we could apply today? You know, we have to uh, – anybody who looks into war, I, I think the conclusion you come down with – I always think of Dwight Eisenhower saying this is, you know, every weapon we built – is a robbery from a poor, a poor person who isn't eating. Um, war is something we face. We've got the Ukraine situation. We've got, you know, enemies around the world. Uh, but it is such a terrible thing, and we do a terrible job of it. Um, you know, one of the things, I've written books about slavery, or slave owners, and you know, I, contemporary people say, oh, how could you write about George Washington or James Madison? They owned slaves. And I say, well, you know, that was what their time allowed. What do we do today that people 200 years from now are going to look back and say, how could they do that? And, you know, one of the answers is, you know, well, we, we eat animals. Maybe another answer is, you know, we're not doing too well on climate. And another answer would be, well, you know, we still kill each other at war. That's not impressive. And it, it, I mean, I'm being silly. It's tragic. It's always tragic. And that's something we don't think hard about much anymore. It, when, when I was a kid, we worried about this armament. We don't anymore. Like we wouldn't dare consider having like a Roman Colosseum and fights to the death. That's, you know, we've evolved past that. We... Kind of eventually evolve past. Well, it's it's you you kill people on Facebook. No, now remember? it's on social media. Yeah, yeah. You, you look at but, how many hits a, a a a piece gets when there's somebody thrashing somebody in the street, uh, somebody beating somebody up in school. That's the new Coliseum, man. Social media, Twitter. Well, except that Facebook's not a real place. 
It can reach a lot more people than held the co- were held in the Colosseum. I know, but you can turn it off. Well, you can. You, you can, can you, you, if you were a gladiator you can in the Roman Colosseum, you, you could not have war. You couldn't log off and get spared from a lion. You were just getting eaten. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Am, am I wrong, John? Like, I, 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 as someone who... Oh, finish that sentence. No, <laughs> as someone who... No, as someone who, who takes a fair share I'd of... I'd like to log on, off from getting eaten by a lion. <laughs> Let me ask you a, 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 a question here, David. And um, We have uh, a thing I do in the morning today in history, right? Mm-hmm. And it goes back... This morning, the first entry was from, I think, 766 B.C., it doesn't matter what the year is and how far back I go in today in history, though, because there's always an entry about a battle, yeah. some king, some land, some conqueror, right? It, I mean, you go back into the Bible and Cain and Abel, right? So as long as there's been two people around, at least one of them's wanted to kill the other one. And then you just keep adding more people and the battles get bigger and the stakes get higher and the way to killing people gets a lot easier than it is. There, we do amazing things as humans, but we... We can't overcome that base instinct to kill, though. Yeah, I, I, I've been doing some research recently on George Patton, who's, of course, a, one of our great warriors. And there's this wonderful speech. He, he gave wonderful speeches, but one wonderful speech he gave um, during World War II to his men. And he said, you know, the reason we had to fight this battle was there were these Nazi son of guns who thought they were Superman and we had to take them down. And, well, you know, also men just like to fight. And, you know, Patton was capable of saying things other people won't say in, in saying them in public. And that really caught me up. I mean, nobody says that anymore. But there's something to it. And it, it's not <laughs> to our credit. No. And David O. Stewart has been our guest, author of The Burning Land. Uh, by the way, where can we get the book, David? <laughs> uh, your best bet is probably Amazon. You can order it from your local store. Well, if you're going to write a Civil War book, this is as good of an area to do research in as ever. No, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Great to have you with us, sir. It is-